Good morning. Any questions for me? That's number seven if you want to drop it. <laughs> number seven? Yeah, you're right there. Okay. Okay, if there are no questions, let's get uh, started. I have the quiz prepared, but I had some requests from a few students that we have other exams today. So I decided not to give it today. So the probability is 50% the next Thursday or Tuesday. The last lecture, we won't have a quiz for sure. So just review, okay? So there will be a quiz either this Thursday or next uh, Tuesday. <clears throat> and there will be one one more assignment I, I plan to give. And um, then maybe I'll give the last one as not an assignment, meaning you don't have to turn it in, but to expose you to, there are two things I want you to work out problems. One would be on the interpolation of polynomials, and the other one would be on the boundary value problems that we are seeing currently. Now, both are important from the final exam point of view, uh, but I don't know, do you guys mind doing the assignment till the last day of the class? I think we are kind of running out of time, so maybe I thought I will just reduce the assignment to one, and then I'll give you one problem set for you to work on your own. But uh, no solutions will be posted for that. Okay, so I'll just give you a set of practice problems for you to work on uh, after you're prepared for the exam. Okay, any questions or comments? I'm working on the next assignment number eight right now, so hopefully I'll put it before the end of today or early tomorrow. Uh, so if there are no questions, let's uh, continue with boundary value problems. Uh, in the last class, we saw the, how to implement a derivative boundary condition, an insulated tip problem. The general idea of how to implement a derivative boundary condition is what you should get from that. And uh, then we saw that the tridiagonal structure of the matrix was destroyed. We went into the code to see how to implement sparse solvers uh, in MATLAB. And the key in using the derivative boundary condition is to maintain the truncation error to be of the same order of each square as the differential equation. Okay? And uh, as I said, it resulted in a matrix that was not tridiagonal. And we learned how to use sparse solvers for such a problem. And then we looked at the efficiency calculations uh, using derivative and integral method. Okay? And uh, towards the end of the class, we saw how to use ComSol to set up the same problem without any programming. And I'm going to show you one more time ComSol before the end of the class, maybe for this particular problem that we are going to study today. Okay? Uh, this problem occurs in many uh, combustion or catalytic combustion problems, reaction problems. So what you have is physically you have the geometry could be different, but in this case we have a catalyst pellet, okay, that's the center of the axis, a pellet of certain thickness. And we are going to take the thickness to be of length 2, we are doing non-dimensionalized version of it, okay. So if this is your psi coordinate, psi goes from minus 1 to plus 1. And within the catalyst pellet, there is a reaction. You are probably burning methane or something uh, as a catalytic reaction. So it generates heat. Okay? And that heat of reaction is what this term is. If you look at mathematically, this equation is very similar to the equation that we saw and learned to solve in the previous two lectures, except this term, the additional term that I am circling here, was a linear term that represented convective heat transfer to the environment from a fin. Now the physical interpretation is different, but the mathematical equation looks very similar. Okay? So theta is the dimensionless temperature, which is a function of the independent variable psi. 
So what we want to do is solve this equation so that I can plot from minus 1 to plus 1, what is the value of theta? And I'm told that, sorry, this should be 0. Okay, Theta at both the boundaries are at 0. That is, the edges of the catalyst pellet are exposed to room temperature. So we are using room temperature to normalize it, as we did in the thin problem. So the dimensionless temperature is 0 at the two ends, and it is some value in between. And the profile is going to look something like this. That is going to be theta as a function of psi that is going to satisfy this differential equation and satisfy these boundary conditions. Obviously, by inspection, you can say that it satisfies the boundary condition because the boundary condition at the two ends are zero. But in between, there is a profile. That profile must satisfy this differential equation. Okay, So it comes from a reaction engineering problem. <coughs> Previous one was from a heat transfer problem. Okay, Here, you do have heat transfer. The heat that is being generated inside if you look at the temperature profile, it's going to be like this. So the heat is generated and it is being dissipated, conducted away. So it's reaction plus heat of conduction. conduction okay. So we're going to balance these two to predict what the temperature profile is. I'm not deriving this equation from basic heat energy balance equation, but we just we have seen that idea before. So we're just going to see what are the differences between this problem and the previous problem, and how do I solve this particular problem using method of finite differences and then using COMSOL. Okay? That is using MATLAB first and then using COMSOL. Now, a few questions for you. Is this a uh, lumped or a distributed parameter problem? Distributed. distributed. Because you have the dependent variable theta depending on one independent variable which is a space, spatial variable. Psi is the distance. Okay, So theta depends on the distance, so it's a distributed parameter problem. Is it steady state or dynamic? Steady state, because there is no time dependence. Now, the same problem could be posed as a dynamic problem if I'm interested in starting up of the reaction. The initial catalyst pellet is initially at room temperature, and then I'm feeding the reactants and igniting the reaction. So if I'm interested in answering the question, how long does it take before the reaction reaches a steady state, then I should pose it as a dynamic problem, and then it will become, uh, what kind of an equation will that be? Or dynamic distributed problem. It's a partial differential equation. It will become a partial differential equation. Okay? Um, COMSOL can handle that easily. MATLAB cannot. Okay? We need to do a lot of work, a lot of programming to do that. But let's focus right now on the uh, steady state distributed problem. So it is an ordinary differential equation. Is it initial or boundary value type? It's a boundary value type because the unknown are given at two different locations, two boundaries. Okay, So there is a fi finite boundary to the problem, so it is a boundary value problem. So it is uh, distributed steady <coughs> boundary value problem. Okay? Is it linear or nonlinear? It's highly nonlinear. Where is the nonlinear term? The e to the power, this entire thing. Now, what are the parameters in the problem? Independent variable is psi. Dependent variable is theta. Parameters are? What do you understand by a parameter? Any number that's a constant in that equation. Okay. So in this case, mu and epsilon are parameters. Okay. <coughs> So when you do the reaction kinetics, if you're done in physical chemistry or you will do it again in a reaction design problem, epsilon will be called a pre-exponential factor for the reaction mechanism and mu is related to the heat of reaction of a particular chemical reaction. Okay, So it is that equation that we need to solve. We understand something about the nature of the problem, that it is nonlinear, 
boundary value problem. So this is an illustration of how do I set up the finite difference method for nonlinear problem and how does it differ from what we have seen for a linear problem. After we do this today, we will go into ComSol and set it up. And then I'm not going to do the MATLAB part because that's a variation that I might want you to play with in preparing for the exam. And then we'll see how to extend it to systems of equations when you have two equations. Here I have only one equation. Okay? How does the method of finite differences, uh, how can we adapt it for a system of two equations? Let me ask you a question. If I give you this and say go and develop the finite difference method, what would be my starting point? I know the domain in psi goes from minus 1 to plus 1, right? So I need to take that domain and divide it. So build a mesh, discretize it and build a mesh and introduce variables at those unknown points. Instead of finding theta as a continuous function of psi, which there is no hope, even if you go to a mathematician and ask, solve this for me, will not be able to do it because there is no analytical method in general for nonlinear problems. It turns out this particular problem is a very famous problem in reaction engineering. And so mathematicians have been able to develop analytical result when mu equal to zero. And but when mu is not a zero, there is no analytical solution known for this particular one. Is it? It's a good question. When mu is equal to zero, is it linear or nonlinear? e to the power theta is there. So it is still nonlinear. When mu equal to zero, it's only the denominator that I get rid of. Okay. This term I get rid of. Oops, I really got rid of it. But still it remains a nonlinear problem. For that nonlinear problem, there is an analytical solution. So your final exam question could be I give you that equation and say verify that is a solution. Okay. Something that, that you did in the midterm exam. Most of you get that part, of course, but there are some still and trying to understand what is the meaning of it, what do I mean by verify that a solution is a valid solution to a given differential equation. Okay, any questions? So the first thing that I do, as I said, is divide my domain from minus 1 to plus 1, this is psi, in equal intervals. Okay, so I can use the same labeling scheme as I did before because both the temperatures at the ends are known. So they are not going to be part of the unknown set of variables. So I can label them as 0, 1, 2, n, n plus 1. The reason I put 0 and n plus 1 is then I have 1 to n. There are n unknowns. Okay. And so that's the first step. So what I mean by that now is instead of finding theta as a continuous function of psi, I'm going to approximate it as theta at psi i, which is going to be, I'm going to call it as theta i. So theta 1 means what is the temperature value at grid point 1, theta 2 means what is the temperature value at grid point 2, etc. So I have introduced by doing this a set of unknowns, I'm going to call that as vector x, consisting of theta 1, theta 2, all the way up to theta n. I have n unknowns that I need to find in such a way that differential equation is approximately satisfied. Okay, so it's really not a difficult problem to uh, develop the method of finite differences, but it integrates everything that we have seen because once you have done it, you will reduce the differential equation to a set of algebraic equations in these discrete unknowns that we have here. So if there are n, n unknowns, we must develop n equations. And those equations you will find. Let me write it out and then we'll explore what the nature of those equations are. Okay, so I go back to this equation and let me just get rid of this so we can see. Okay. And I need to evaluate this equation at every grid point i in the interior from i going from 1 to n. That's how I generate my n equations that are approximately representing this differential equation. So what do I do? I take wherever I have the derivative, I find an equal and finite difference approximation for that. Wherever I have a function, I just evaluate that function at i. So it is as if I am evaluating this entire equation at every grid point. But at a typical grid point i, I replace all the derivatives with finite differences and any function that appears by itself, I simply evaluate it at that particular location. Do you understand what I mean by that? So it's a second derivative, so I need to replace that by a second order 
finite difference. So the first term, fi is the ith equation, is going to be equal to theta i minus 1 minus 2 theta i plus theta i plus 1 divided by h squared plus, that is the first term, that has a truncation error of order h squared, we know that. I'm just writing it to indicate that this is this has error. We're going to throw that term out when you're solving this. Plus this next term in the series, uh, in that equation, is an algebraic equation. So all I have to do is evaluate that at that particular location equal to zero. Valid for i going from one all the way up to n. So for every grid point, that is my template. I have replaced my differential equation by my finite difference equation. And I have n equations and I have identified n unknowns. Okay? As I said, this is just to indicate the order of the error and I can control the error by choosing my h. So what would h be in this particular case? How would I calculate h? the right track, is it 1 or 2? Because my x value, psi value goes from minus 1 to 1. Okay? So my entire range for psi is 2. I'm dividing that length 2 into n plus 1 equal interval. So it's going to be 2 divided by n plus 1. So I choose n, the number of grid points, and then I calculate h, and I use that h in this equation. So I'm going to rewrite that equation as equal to theta i minus 1 minus uh, 2 theta i. Oops, my apologies. I don't follow my own rules. <laughs> Normally I turn it off, but I forgot to. Okay, so theta i minus 1 mi plus, minus 2 theta i plus theta i plus 1. I'm going to multiply throughout by h squared, okay? Plus h squared epsilon e to the power theta i divided by 1 plus mu theta i equal to 0. Again, i going from 1 to n. That is my final equation. That's an algebraic equation relating theta 1, theta 2, theta 3, etc. Any questions on that? That's not a good sign. <laughs> Do you understand? Is it easy enough? Or if you understand it, then I can probe some additional questions. So I have formulated n equations from 1 to n. You all know how to write a function to be solved with f sol. Okay. All you have to do is pass a vector x to f sol, and then x will contain theta 1, theta 2, I guess, for from theta 1 to theta n, and you will assemble all your n equations. In this particular case, is that a linear or a nonlinear algebraic equation? It's an algebraic equation, right? There is no derivative there. We have replaced the derivative with differences. So all I have is at the discrete points, temperature unknowns. So it's an algebraic equation. Is it linear or nonlinear? It's a nonlinear. It still remains nonlinear. So when you have an original differential equation is nonlinear, when you replace it with finite differences, you will still get nonlinearity in the same terms. You can see the nonlinearity is the exponential. Now the unknowns are theta 1, theta 2, theta 3, theta 4, theta i in general. Okay? So that's where the nonlinearity enters in the same fashion. So it is a nonlinear equation. So how would you solve it? Of course, f sol is 1, but I'm going to ask you to solve it by Newton method. So what does that mean? We need to construct the Jacobian. Okay? So that could be a tedious task, okay, because you need to take the derivatives of these nonlinear expressions and evaluate them and write a program to evaluate each one of them. But in your last assignment, you know exactly how to do that construction of the Jacobian. Okay? So it's a nonlinear problem. equations. So the method is xn plus 1, sorry, let me call it xp plus 1 
equals x p n we are using for the number of grid points so p is the iteration number minus j inverse f so p equals 0 1 2 etc that is the iteration number so you're going to make a guess and you're going to evaluate your f you're going to evaluate your j and put it on the right hand side and keep repeating it so that is newton's method So when you are writing the function for this, the function, how would the MATLAB look like? Can you kind of visualize in your mind how you would? You want to make it general for any n because n is something that we are going to choose. Okay, it could be 20 or 200 or 20,000, 20, right? What I'm looking for is, you're going to write a function and you need to put a loop obviously, right? You don't want to write the 20,000 functions explicitly. So you're going to put a loop. And so the loop will go from a certain starting to ending range and you'll have the same template. Just type this equation as it is. Except you need to make an exception for when i equal to two, two, two locations we need to make an exception. Where would that be? First point and the last point. When, when you put i equal to one, you will have theta zero, okay? So let me just write that explicitly. For i equal to one, you have in the template of the equation, f one is going to be equal to theta zero minus two theta one plus theta two plus h square epsilon e to the power theta one divided by one plus mu theta one equal to zero. So in this one, you're going to set this equal to what? zero because the boundary theta zero at the left boundary is boundary condition it's known this is how we impose the boundary condition onto our model all we have done so far in here is replace the differential equation by the differential equation which is valid for every point from i equal to one to n but when i equal to one you're going to get theta zero in the formula theta zero is the left boundary okay similarly when i equal to n you're going to get theta n plus one which is your right boundary, okay? So whatever the value is, you need to plug in there. Do you have a question? Okay. So what would be the range for the loop? Two to n minus one, you could use the loop and that particular equation. So you could have something like for i going from two to n minus one. And then you put that expression, fi equal to theta i minus 1 minus 2 theta i plus theta i plus 1 plus h square epsilon exponential of theta i divided by 1 plus mu theta i. Okay? End that. And then you will have fn, the last one. And that will involve theta n plus 1. So when you write this one, you're going to get theta n minus 1 minus 2 theta n plus theta n plus 1 plus h square epsilon exponential of theta n divided by 1 plus mu theta n. Okay, you need to of course use the subscripts properly. I'm just indicating the basic structure of how you would write. So essentially four or five lines to solve this particular problem using f -sol. If I ask you to use f -sol, that's all you need to do. But if I ask you to use Newton method, then you need to figure out the Jacobian structure. That's what you're going to do next. Any questions on this so far? So this is going to be equal to zero by the boundary condition. Any questions? Yeah. Ah, uh, it won't be equal to, I mean, we want to make it equal to zero, but the function that you're going to write will just have F1 equal to that. But if you go back to this, we want every function to be equal to zero. We want to find those values of theta that make the function equal to zero. That's what Newton method will do. You provide some initial guess, and that initial guess will not make all the n functions equal to zero. So that function will just return the function value to f sol or Newton, and then they will find a new guess. Okay? But I shouldn't have written it as equal to zero in here because this is not part of the function that you're going to write. But the goal is to drive all the functions to zero. Thank you for catching that.
Okay. Now, what would the Jacobian structure look like? Okay. So on the horizontal axis, what are we going to put? Theta 1, theta 2, all the way up to theta n, the variables. Down the line, we are going to put equation 1 or f1, f1, f2, all the way up to fn. Okay. By simply looking at that function, for example, here you have that function fi. Can you tell me what are the terms that are going to be non-zero? f1 with respect to theta 1. Does f1 contain theta 1? Here is f1. It contains theta 1. It contains theta 1 in many places. That partial derivative is going to be fairly complicated. Okay, But it is there. It's not 0. f1 with respect to theta 2 would be what? Just 1. Okay, f1 with respect to theta 3? 0. And everything else on that row will be 0. Okay, so in order to fill the first row, this is what I want in an exam. When I say figure out the structure and give me the Jacobian elements, I want you to, you can write this for example df1 d theta1 and then if you can take the derivative, take the derivative and show me what the number is. If not, put a symbol but then below that you need to tell me what that is. And then the rest are all zeros. Even in the current assignment, people have been asking me, I do want to see this Jacobian on a piece of paper before you program it. Okay? In an exam, that's all you need to do. And then go to the next equation, equation 2, F2. So now you need to internally think in your mind, when i is equal to 2, what are the terms that are going to appear in here? For F2, theta 1 will appear, theta 2 will appear, and theta 3 will appear. But everything else will be 0. Okay? So what will be theta 1? 1. What will be theta 2? The derivative of 2? You don't know. You need to figure that out. df2 d theta 2. And then the df2 theta 3 will be 1 and then the rest will all be 0. Exactly. So now you see the, as soon as you see the pattern, you can go into programming. Okay? Because you have figured out what you, each term is going to look like. It's just the same pattern repeating. Okay? So it's going to be tridiagonal. And that means all the upper diagonal elements will be 1, all the lower diagonal elements will be 1, and the diagonal elements will be that partial derivative that you need to figure out. Everything else is going to be 0. If you can give me something like that, that's fine, because I understand, I know that you understand what needs to be done. Okay? Now I want you to evaluate what the derivative of dfi with respect to d theta i will be from that equation. <coughs> okay, So what, what would that be? dfi with respect to d theta i. So I want to take the derivative with respect to all these terms. So it's going to be minus 2 plus the derivative of this entire expression. Okay, So it's going to be min oops, minus 2 plus d d theta i of e to the power theta i divided by 1 plus mu theta i multiplied by h square epsilon. Okay, h square epsilon multiplied by that partial derivative. Okay, and that you need to do so minus 2 plus h square epsilon. So e to the power something, you are applying the chain rule, it's going to be the same thing e to the power theta i divided by. 1 plus mu theta i multiplied by the derivative of what is appearing in the exponentiation. And there itself we need to apply the chain rule. It's going to be 1 plus mu theta i what? Square into 1 plus mu theta i times the derivative of the numerator which is 1 minus the numerator times the derivative of the denominator which will be mu. Right? So this mu theta i and that mu theta i will cancel out. So all you will have is minus 2 plus h square epsilon e to the power theta i divided by 1 plus mu theta i divided by 1 plus mu theta i square. 
that's that's what I need in an exam. Okay, in a, in a problem like this, you need to figure out all the derivatives and tell me what it is. Now you can go and program that particular element. Put a loop around that to evaluate all the diagonal elements. Or you can use that DRID function that we wrote earlier. Okay. Any questions on that? We will see how to set this up in ComSol without going through any of these exercises. That's where the power of the advanced computer simulations come in, whether it is ISIS or ComSol, uh, to co solve such complicated problems with ease. Before I do that, I want to look at a few variations. I told you that this particular solution is going to look like this with a maximum in the middle always. Why? Because tacit and symmetry. Okay? What happens in minus 1 to 0 is the mirror image of what happens from 0 to 1. So I could replace this problem with a slight variation. And the variation would be I cut my domain from psi equal to 0 to 1. If I do that, what should be the boundary condition on the left side? Now my domain becomes from here to the right, right side. Zero for theta. Is theta zero here? I want to get the same solution. All I'm doing is I'm recognizing that instead of, for example, if I take from minus one to plus one and I use 200 points to get certain accuracy. Yeah. Exactly. So you want to impose that the derivative is equal to zero at the center. At symmetry point, you have a derivative as equal to zero because what happens in the left hand side is the same as what happens in the right hand side. So the derivative, if you evaluate that, will be zero. Okay? And the reason that we want to do that is if I use 200 points to get a certain accuracy of order h squared, I can get the same accuracy perhaps using only 100 points if I solve for half the domain. But I need to recognize that the boundary condition I need to impose on the left boundary is now the derivative. Okay? How does that change our formulation? Okay, so this is a variation. Use symmetry <coughs> at psi equal to zero. And that symmetry condition is d theta d psi at psi equal to 0 is 0. The other condition, of course, remains the same. Theta at psi equal to 1 is 0. And the differential equation remains the same. d squared theta d psi squared plus epsilon e to the power theta divided by 1 plus mu theta equal to 0. This is a new problem, a variation on the problem. Okay, So this is what I would expect you to be able to do in an exam. Okay, So you have already seen couple of problems, so a variation on this problem with boundary conditions being changed. Okay, So how would you begin if this is the problem that you see in the exam? The domain you will determine as from psi equal to 0 to 1. So the boundary tells you what is the range in which you will be solving the problem. So in this case, the domain goes from psi equal to 0 to 1. This is my psi. Okay. But I want the temperature profile to look something like this, with the maximum in the center of the domain. Okay. So the boundary condition is given, d theta d psi is equal to 0. I don't know what the temperature value is. It need not be 1. It, could be, it depends on the heat of reaction term. If the heat of reaction is very high, temperature can be 10. Okay. If the heat produced is very small, the temperature can be 0.1. Okay, but I, all I want is the derivative to be equal to zero. So anybody wants to start suggesting ideas? How would, what, where would I begin? Yeah. You're way ahead. The first thing. That's very good. Excellent. You have already seen this one. You have seen the variations from the previous part. Okay, so you can complete it. But to begin, what you would do is you would define your variable as again 0, theta 0, theta 1, you will construct the grid point all the way to theta n, theta n plus 1. Okay, But now the x vector must consist of 
theta zero because theta zero I don't know. Okay, so I will include that theta zero, theta one, all the way to theta n. So I will end up with n plus one equations. Okay. Of those n plus 1 equations, n equations will be the same as before. They come from the differential equation at the interior. And what you are suggesting is that the left boundary, the n plus 1th equation will come from a three-point forward formula using these three points. That will complete the n plus 1 equations in n plus 1 unknowns. It may not be tridiagonal. Okay, if you are using three-point forward formula, it won't be tridiagonal. But that doesn't matter. So you still need to figure out the Jacobian for that structure because it's still a nonlinear problem. Okay. So I'm just kind of opening the door and asking you to think about it. I'm glad some of you are seeing the light till the end of the tunnel, but I would strongly encourage you to figure out problems of this type, variations of this type before the final exam. There's going to be one question in that. Okay. Okay. So before I look at the other variation with two equations and two unknowns. Let me set it up in COMSOL so, because I'm going to give you one problem in COMSOL and assignment as well. It's such a powerful tool, I think you should know how it works. Okay. So start the COMSOL multiphysics. <coughs> this is solving the nonlinear problem. From a COMSOL point of view, it doesn't matter whether it's linear or nonlinear. The procedure is exactly the same because the mathematics is internally handled away from the user. Okay. All we are going to do is define what the problem is what the uh, uh, domain of interest is and the independent variable, what are the boundary conditions, and then ask it to solve. Okay, so whenever you start COMSOL, and COMSOL, as I said, is available only in the chemical engineering lab in our building. Okay, so once you start that, you will be presented with select the space dimension. So it is typically meant for distributed problems. So you will have variations in one dimension or two dimensions or three dimensions. And we will see a two dimensional example in the next class. Okay. So in this case, I just have one independent variable. So I'm going to pick one dimension. Okay. And I go to the next and it asks me, okay, what is the problem? What is the physics? What is the equation? So here I'm going to select heat transfer, heat transfer in solids because it is still the same equation. Okay, So I select that and go to the next. And is it stationary or time dependent? If you say time dependent, it's going to solve a partial differential equation. If you say stationary, it's going to solve an ordinary differential equation. Stationary is steady state. Okay, And then finish that. And in the model builder, it automatically adds several folders. And these are the folders that define various features of the problem and the solution method. Okay, So the next thing I need to do is build my geometry. So it automatically places the cursor there in the geometry. And depending on what folder you select in here, you will see that the icons that are available on the top dynamically change. Right now I'm building geometry. So it gives me all the icons that are suitable for geometry building. So if I want to draw a circle or a rectangle, whatever shape, geometrical shape, I'll be able to draw it using these icons. Um, it has features for importing drawings from other programs like AutoCAD. Have you used AutoCAD? Never heard of AutoCAD? Any CAD design problem? Few of you have. Okay. So these are CAD, uh, computer aided design and drawing programs for building machinery parts. Okay. So they are fairly sophisticated. They will allow you to construct three-dimensional objects complicated in shape that you can then pass on to the machine shop and they just take that file that you have constructed and feed it to the lathe and the lathe can machine that for you. So the technology has progressed so far that with computers we can do a lot of things. We can actually build and fabricate things. At the same time, take the same geometry and bring it into ComSol and say, okay, I want to look at the stress distribution in this part to see where is the weakest point that is going to fail. Mechanical engineers will typically do that. Or chemical engineers, we want to see what is the temperature distribution. Okay, where is the heat of reaction high? Where is the reaction rate likely to be high? In complex reactor geometry, we can do the same thing. Okay, but for our case, in this particular case, it's a very simple geometry, just a straight line. Okay, because our domain is straight. So I just pick this line element and then draw a line. Okay. Of course, I've drawn a line. I've not fixed the length. Okay. So the moment I select that, 
Here it creates a new folder called integral. And the line that I kind of drew, drew is going from minus 0.9 to 0.4. I don't want that. I want it to go from oops, minus 1 to 1. So I change, just go and change it there. Minus 1 <coughs> to 1. Okay. And then fit that. So now you see the drawing defining your domain. Going from minus 1 to plus 1. Still not fitting the entire thing there. This is supposed to zoom it to exactly fit in there, but it's not fitting in there. But the domain I know is minus 1 to plus 1. How do I know that? By looking at this interval. I've defined the x, the psi domain, to be from minus 1 to plus 1. Okay. Then I go into uh, the global. Uh, let me look at the equation to make sure what equation I'm solving. Okay. So this is my domain. Psi going from minus 1 to plus 1. Now it shows the correct domain, minus 1 to plus 1. Okay. And the equation that I'm going to solve is this equation that you see here. Okay. Are you able to see? Follow? Are you able to see in the back? Okay. So here, what should I put for k so that this equation looks like the equation I want to solve? The equation I want to solve is. Uh, d squared theta d psi squared plus epsilon e to the power theta divided by 1 plus mu theta equal to 0. This is the equation I want to solve. But the equation that they have given looks something like this. Rho CPU uh, gradient of t equals dot k dot t plus q. So this program has a lot of these templated equations. And our job is to make this templated equation look like this equation. So in order to do that, for example, I can set rho as equal to 0. So the left-hand side drops out. Then I should set up k equal to 1. Okay. And what does this del operator symbolize? The del operator symbolizes the derivative in more than one dimension. It's called a Laplace. Okay. But in one dimension, this del operator is nothing but this term operating on theta or t. Okay. So within the program, I'm going to call my dependent variable as t. And then I need to make q as equal to this entire term. I need to put that expression. Okay. That's an algebraic expression that I can put. Okay. So that's how I would use ComSol. What is the problem I want to solve? And how can I map that into one of the templated problems? That's the easiest one. Of course, you can go into solving problems for which there is no template. Then you can build your own equations into ComSol, which is more powerful. That you will learn at the graduate level. Right now, all you want to do is, how do I take a heat transfer problem and make it look like the problem that I want to solve? So I'm going to now make model inputs. Uh, Heat conduction, user defined, I put a value of 1. Okay, and then the density. Now, when it says from material, there is a material database. You can select, for, a, for example, you can say this catalyst is made of aluminum. Then it will take the properties of the aluminum for density, thermal conductivity, etc. But in our case, I just want this to be 0, row to be 0. Okay, and then it doesn't matter what CP is. Okay, uh, so I have made part of the equation look like that, but I need to add the source term, the Q term. So I go to the heat transfer model, and whenever you are on the folder, if you right click your mouse, it will give you a whole set of menus that you can add, folders that you can add. So one of them is heat source. Okay, so this term is called a source term, heat generation, source of heat. That's what this is, heat of reaction. So now I have Q, and I need to identify that this Q is applied to the domain that I have, the only domain I have. So I'm going to add that. Okay, So that source term is going to be applicable in that domain. So you can see the design of ComSol is such that you can have three catalysts of three different materials. And in each zone, you can have different thermal conductivity, <coughs> different heat of reaction, and you can handle that very easily by di dividing into three do different domains. If you want to do that by manually, that's going to be a master's thesis, perhaps. That's the amount of work that is involved in doing things like that. Okay. So here you have Q, and I want to replace that Q 
by this expression, the expression that I have here, epsilon multiplied by exponential. You can use MATLAB syntax here. When you're putting a formula like this, you can use exactly the MATLAB syntax times t divided by 1 plus mu times t. That's it. So you just type the expression as it is. COMSOL takes care of discretizing all the derivatives, okay? Assembling the Jacobian matrix, everything it does automatically. You need to specify any algebraic expression in your different, uh, differential equation, okay? So, but now, of course, I have introduced two symbols, epsilon and mu. So, I need to provide what are those values for epsilon and mu. So, I go into the global definition, right-click, select the parameters, and enter those parameters. Epsilon as 0 and mu as, say, 1. Okay, I just pick some numbers. Any questions so far? Good question. That's what I asked. Stop and ask. If I put the zero, what am I saying effectively? I'm saying that there is no, no heat generation. If there is no heat generation, and if the two boundaries at zero temperature, okay, this is at zero, this is at zero. Sorry. This is psi equals minus one, psi equals plus one. And this is at the temperature of zero. Then I put zero, then I put zero. What would be the temperature profile look like? Straight there is no variation in temperature, everywhere is zero. But then I can say put 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, etc. So I can get a solution for a whole series, but I'm initially starting it with zero. Okay, good question. Any any other questions on what we have done so far? The thing I want to emphasize is we have not written one piece of code to solve a complicated nonlinear problem like this. Okay, so go to study stationary. Now, if you right click on that, you have the parameter sweep. That's the one that allows you to specify any of the parameters over a range to get a solution, not just for one value, but a whole range of values. So when you say add the parameter, it drops down a table and says, these are the two parameters you have defined, which one you want to continue or uh, sweep. So let me pick epsilon. Then it says, what are the values? Okay, you put the values here. 0 0.05, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0.6, 0.8, 1, for example. So you can do MATLAB syntax here too? You can do MATLAB syntax here too, yeah. It integrates very well with MATLAB, okay? <clears throat> In fact, if you click this one, it tells you you can do it by start incremental step. Uh, you can use the same syntax, the column syntax if you want, okay? Uh, so that's a parameter sweep and the mesh, we haven't talked about the mesh at all. Here is the mesh, okay? So it's a physics controlled mesh. That's telling ComSol, giving its intelligence to say, how should I place these grids? How many grids do I need? I don't want to make a decision on N, for example. <coughs> but you want to say, I want to make a normal distribution or fine or extra fine qualitatively. So let me just pick extra fine, okay? And so I have specified something about the mesh. I specified the equations. I need to specify the boundary condition. The boundary conditions are specified also from the model. So if you right click, it will say temperature. Okay. So a temperature folder allows you to identify what are the grid points where you want the temperature to be specified. In this particular case, it's going to be the left boundary. So I select that and add and select the right boundary and add. So on both the boundaries, I want the temperature to be equal to zero. Okay. You can obviously extend it. Can I, for example, set the temperature at any other intermediate point to be any value? Obviously, you can. Then it will be called multi-point boundary value problem. These are called two-point boundary value problems. Okay. So you have specified the boundary conditions. You have specified the equations. And all you need to do is hope that it will solve. So study and then equal sign, which means compute, and it should start computing the solutions for you. There it is. That's the temperature profile for all values of epsilon that you have identified, starting from epsilon equal to 0, 0 0.05, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, and 1. I guess it took us 10 minutes to solve that. So I want you to kind of know that such powerful tools are available for simulation. As a process engineer, if you end up as a process engineer, 
your job would be to understand the process, to model the process. And HISIS is one powerful tool when you have a lumped parameter, steady state or dynamic model. And um, there are other models called uh, ANSYS CFX. And uh, this comes all is one that solves distributed steady state and dynamic problems in one or two or three dimensions. Okay, any questions on that? And it integrates well with MATLAB. So if you have more complicated geometries, you can build the geometry in MATLAB and export it to COMSOL. And I will show you that process also in one of the classes. Okay. No questions? Can I show, shut down this? You may want to go through this part of the video because I'm running through quickly on how to set up the problem. When you go for the first time, it's going to be pretty challenging or daunting to set up all the parts. So I'm going to give you a similar problem for you to work and I want you to go through this exercise of setting it up so that you're becoming familiar at least with such tools. Okay. Now, the last part of this uh, section before we go on to initial value problems uh, would be how do I extend these ideas to solve not single equation but a system of equations. Okay. So here I have the model that is given to you in front of you. What can you tell about the problem? Lump, distributed, steady, dynamic, linear, nonlinear, boundary value problem, initial value problem. It is a, what are the unknowns? The unknowns are u and v. And that makes it nonlinear because you have e to the power u and e to the power v. Now, where does this equation occur? It occurs again in catalytic reaction engineering problems where u could be the concentration inside the catalyst and v could be the temperature inside the catalyst. So the temperature affects the concentration because higher temperature means a more faster reaction rate. Okay? And the faster reaction rate means more heat is generated and that affects the temperature. So is it, it, this would be called a coupled problem because u variable affects what happens to v and v variable affects what happens to u. So if you look at the first equation as the equation for u, you will find that v appears there. So v affects what's going to happen to u. Similarly, if you look at v as the independent, the dependent variable in the second equation, u occurs there. So these are coupled both ways. u affects v and v affects u. Okay. And is it a boundary value problem or initial value problem? It's a boundary value problem because you have x equal to 0 and x equal to 1. So that sets the domain of interest. x goes from 0 to 1. Okay. And the boundary conditions are because you have a second order equation in u, you need two boundary conditions for u. Those are 0 at both ends. Similarly, you have a second order equation in v, you need two boundary conditions and those are also 0 at both ends. Okay. So we know something about the model now. It is a boundary value problem coupled nonlinear differential equations. Okay? So my domain is going to go from x0 to 1. Okay? I'm going to divide that into equal number of intervals. Okay? Label them as 0, 1, 2, some typical point i, and n plus 1. So my h is going to be equal to 1 over n plus 1 because my distance goes from 0 to 1. So the length that I'm interested in is 1. I'm dividing that into n plus 1 equal intervals. Okay. And what would be my vector of unknowns at those grid points? Exactly. At every one of those grid points, you'll have two unknowns, one for u and one for v. So u1, v1, u2, v2, u3, v3, etc. You can arrange them in an exam. I would accept e any way that you arrange. One of the ways that I'm going to show you is I'm going to arrange all the u's first and then I'm going to arrange all the v's. And you will see the reason for it when you look at the Jacobian. Because it's a nonlinear problem, you need to construct the Jacobian. right? So it's, I'm going to put it in the form u1, u2, all the way up to un, continued by v1, v2, all the way up to vn. So how many unknowns do I have? Exactly. Number of unknowns is 2 times n. 
So when I'm writing a function for f sol, if I choose to solve it with f sol, I, I need to write a function that will take a vector x containing two n entries. And I will interpret these entries as belonging to u1 to un, and then v1 to vn. And inside that, I need to put two loops to evaluate each one of those functions. Okay? So I need to return two n functions. I have two n unknowns and two n uh, functions. So how would I write down the functions? I just look at the first term. These are all algebraic expressions, right? I'm going to evaluate this entire equation, both of the equations at i. That means I'm going to evaluate d square u dx square at i. I'm going to evaluate these at i. I'm going to evaluate these at i. Every grid point. i stands for any grid point, arbitrary grid point. So it's going to be equal to f i is going to be equal to u i minus 1 minus 2 u i plus u i plus 1 divided by h square plus 5 lambda. What is lambda here? It's a parameter. Minus lambda square e to the power u i equal to 0. We want to drive these functions to 0. Okay? And of course, you can multiply throughout by h square if you want and write this as u i minus 1 minus 2 u i plus u i plus 1 plus 5 lambda h square u i minus v i minus lambda square h square e to the u i equal to 0. i going from 1 to <coughs> So that num n equations are valid at every one of the interior points. But when i equal to 1, you must impose the left boundary. Because when i equal to 1, you will have u 0. Right? And similarly, when i equal to n, you will have u n plus 1. You should impose the right boundary. So these two must be separated, uh, treated individually, and then you put a loop for the remaining ones to calculate all the functions. Any questions on that? Can you put the two equations into 1 since they would be 0? Uh, that's a good thought. <laughs> but you will lose, you will end up with that. What you're saying is, let me, I think I understand what you're saying. Let me write the second equation and maybe that will clarify for others too. The second set of equations, I'm going to label them as g i. That comes from the v equation, okay? So going back to this equation. So I'm calling this as f i, I'm calling this as g i, okay? i going from 1 to n. So g i is going to be equal to v i minus 1 minus 2 v i plus v i plus 1 divided by h square. Let me skip a step and multiply throughout by h square. So it's plus 5 lambda h square u i plus v i and minus lambda square h square e to the power v i equal to 0. Again, i going from 1 to n. So I have an equation coming from the first template fi, which is the first equation, and n equations coming from the second template for gi. What you are asking is, can I set fi equal to gi? Is that what you are asking? Uh, kind of putting them all into one line. The problem would be, you, you, you cannot just deal with them. You can obviously say, because fi is equal to 0, gi is equal to 0, fi must be equal to gi, that's one set of equations. But you must still retain either the first or the second set because you need a total of two n equations. You have two n unknowns. Okay? So you can make a linear combination of this as another equation, but you must use also one of these sets. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, so if you choose to do that, there is no reason to do that because it will only complicate your derivatives. Because you're not reducing the number of equations, you're not eliminating. If you are able to eliminate bi completely, to reduce the equation to only uh, one of the variable, then you will reduce the number of algebraic equations too. But if you are going to keep ui and vi separately as a number of unknowns, two n unknowns, then you need two n equations. 
You can certainly make a linear combination of this and call it one set, but you still need the other set. Can you say there's three equations that only two independent equations? Pardon me? There's three possible equations that only two independent. No, no, there are the way that we have written out, there are two n independent equations in two n unknowns. But his question was, can I make them equal? Can I combine them? And the answer is, you can combine them. There is no unique way to combine. So, in, that in fact, there are infinitely many combinations that you can make. But you must still end up with two n equations because you have two n unknowns. Okay. Any other questions? These questions are good because that keeps you thinking. Okay. So, at this stage, okay, I have discretized the equations and uh, you've gotten 50 percent of your mark in an exam and you say I want to go and program it in F solve, that's fine. Okay, you know, you should know how to do it. But what I want to focus in the remaining time is if I want to use the Newton method, how would the Jacobian structure look like for system of equations like this? Once you understand this, then you can increase the number of equations to three or four or whatever. The same idea will carry through. So if my vector x consists of this, okay. And this is going to be tough for me to kind of squeeze everything onto the paper. So the Newton method is for that the vector x at p plus one iteration is x at p iteration minus j inverse f. Okay. Uh, maybe let me use a different f for this capital F. Why do I use capital F? Capital F, you don't want to confuse with the other F I have included. So it's going to be F I G I. Capital F is the set of two n functions, all the functions that include both the lowercase f i for u and the g for v. So this is, if n is 10, for example, let's fix ideas. I have 10 grid points, I have 10. Uh, variables in u and 10 variables in b. So I have 20 variables. Okay, So this f represents those 20 functions, the combined functions f and g. So this vector x contains the combined variables u and v. So x will be of length 20, f will be of length 20. What will be j? 20 by 20, right? So j should be 20 by 20. Let me go to this page and see whether I can squeeze that in. So that's going to be j. It's going to be 20 by 20. Okay. And I'm going to draw some lines there to show you the structure. So along the row, I'm going to, uh, I mean, along the column, I'm going to label my variables u1, u2, all the way up to un, and then v1, v2, all the way to vn. And along the rows, I'm going to write the equations f1, f2, up to fn, and then g1 all the way up to gn. Oops. g2 all the way up to gn. Okay. Now, mentally, are you able to form the structure? Exactly. You got it. Okay. I hope everybody is able to do that. This will be two tridiagonal matrices on the blocks. Okay. So if you look at it, for example, F1, if you look at any function, it's going to involve one on the left side, one on the right hand side. Okay. But at the edges, because the left side is a boundary, it will involve only the right side. So F1 will involve U1 and U2. So these two will be non-zero. Everything else will be zero up to that. But how about F1 with respect to V1? You need to go and look at the equation. Fi has Vi in it, right? So you need to take its derivative, okay? So that will be non-zero. Everything else will be zero. It's not four tridiagonal, it's two tridiagonal on the on the two diagonal parts of it. That is, there will be a tridiagonal matrix here, there will be a tridiagonal matrix here, 
but the coupling term that is with B affecting U and U affecting B will be a diagonal term, only the diagonal term, because there is no derivative there in those terms, right? So if you go to the next one, F2 with respect to all the derivatives, okay? F2 will have V1, so that will be not 0. F2 will have U2, that will be not 0. F2 will have U3, that will be not 0. Everything else will be 0. Will F2 have U1, V1? No. Will it have V2? Yes. And then no, again. Okay. So, these are all going to be non-zero. Okay. And similarly, these all will be non-zero. So, that will be a tridiagonal problem, the structure. Okay. For the variable for F with respect to U. Do you have any questions on that? Quadrant 4 will also be a tridiagonal one. And quadrant 3, if you want to call that as 3, will be diagonal again. Okay? And then, of course, in an exam, I expect you to give me all the derivatives as well. Okay? Any questions? Do you understand? How many of you find this challenging? It is, in some sense, challenging, but hopefully by working out, like what you did in your current assignment, constructing the Jacobian is a tedious part. You know what, what to do. So now you need to be able to learn how to handle variations on that from one equation to two equations. Okay? So uh, hopefully the next assignment will give you the opportunity to do that. And here you will once again have a tridiagonal structure. Okay. And you can use the sparse solvers in MATLAB. Of course, you can do the same thing in COMSOL. You just have two equations and you need to program the algebraic part and then you'll be able to solve the same problem without program as well. <coughs> okay. Um, I think that's basically all I had for today. I guess so. Um, let me talk about maybe other variations because we still have 10 minutes. Okay. Um, to recap, if I give you a problem like this, you now know at least three ways of solving it. Okay. Any boundary value problem or a set of boundary value problems. The first one is using MATLAB with BVP4C where you don't have to do any discretization. MATLAB does it, but you write the functions. So what is the key idea in doing that? What do you need to do before you can use BVP4C? Do you remember? If I give you two second order equations, you need to convert them into four first order equations. So BVP4C requires you to present the problem, reformulate the problem in a way that it has only first order equations. Okay? But you can always convert a higher order equation into a set of first order equations. We have seen that. Okay? So using that with BVP4C, we have seen examples. We have done that in an assignment. That's the first method. They all give you the same solution with different discretization errors, perhaps. The second method is using finite differences where we do the discretization, we do the bulk of the work, and we can use FSOL or we can use Newton algorithm to get a solution. And the third one is the COMSOL method, which is essentially it does all the job that we do typically uh, by hand. It does it automatically inside the computer. Okay? And so you have at least three tools for solving boundary value problems. Um, if I give you a model, next topic in our agenda is the initial value problems. And that's the last topic we're going to talk about, cover. So once again, as with all the topics, the question that we are trying to understand at this stage of the course is, how does MATLAB solve the problem using ODE45 or ODE15S? Okay. These are the tools that we have already seen. What are the ideas? What are the algorithms that are used inside ODE45? Finite difference told us what are the ideas that are used by COMSOL or BVP4C. Okay. What, what discretization procedures are done. So in the initial value problem, we have a similar set of ideas that I think you should be exposed to. What is an initial value problem? It's typically, you have an equation of this type, f of y comma t 
So this could be a set of coupled nonlinear ordinary differential equations, but time is typically the independent variable and the vector y could be any length that is a dependent variable and by solution we mean construct y as a function of time. So that is construct a curve, but there is no definite end. So it's not a boundary. You have an initial value and it goes all the way up to infinity. T goes to infinity. Now in typical real problems, you might find that it reaches a steady state. When it reaches a steady state, of course, dy dt goes to zero, you get the algebraic equation. So often the steady state is a limiting condition of a dynamic state when you reach a steady, uh, steady condition. Okay. So the question now is, how does Woody 45 solve such problems? What are the algorithms that are used for that? Okay. So we have already introduced the idea of discretization. ODE45 does exactly the same thing. Whenever we have derivatives in a computer, we cannot deal analytically with derivatives, so we discretize them. So it constructs a set of grid points, and those are called step sizes. And there is, you choose the step size arbitrarily. And the, because there is no finite boundary, it really doesn't influence how far you can integrate. You can integrate using that step size in, indefinitely or for as long as you want. So you can use a step size of 0 0.01 or 0 0.1, whatever, and integrate it 100,000 times or 10,000 times to reach to see what the steady state is, looks, looks like. Okay. So the basic idea then is having constructed the mesh, how can I predict what will be the next value? The initial condition is given. Y at t equal to 0 is some number y0. The initial condition is given. Okay. How do I predict what would be y1, what would be y2, what would be y3? If I label these numbers as 1, 2, 3, my question is what is y1, what is y2, what is y3, etc. Okay. How do we construct that sequence of solutions? And the idea is very simple. Uh, there are, in terms of error control, there are algorithms that are like ODE45 uses a very sophisticated extension of the idea that I'm going to present. And the idea that I'm going to present is replace this by a, maybe you can come up with the idea. Whenever we have derivative, we replace it by difference approximations, right? So you replace this by a first order forward difference method, okay? So what would be the first order forward difference method for d dy dt? Maybe be y n plus 1 minus y, or let's call it i, y i plus 1 minus y i divided by h. h is the distance between two neighboring points. So this distance is h. Okay. So this is the estimate of the derivative. Now, what is the truncation error in that? Is of order h. So this, it is a high truncation error method. Okay. And that is equal to on the right hand side, you have the choice of evaluating it either at i or at i plus 1. That gives rise to two different type of methods. Let's just put it at i for now, okay? yi, comma, ti. Okay, so now you can rearrange that formula and you have converted that into an algebraic equation is equal to yi plus h times f yi. Ti. This has a truncation error of order h. But that formula is valid for i going from 0, 1, 2, etc. So that will, by putting a loop around that, you can predict successive values. What does it geometrically do? We have used algebraic expression to using finite differences, but geometrically you can interpret this as follows yi is the current value. What is fi? What is this term? Is the slope. Is the slope of the function because f is same as dy dt, right? So you draw a slope, draw a tangent to that and multiply it by h. So that should give you the vertical distance. You add it to yi, that gives you what the next value of yi plus 1 is, okay? So that's a fairly simple idea of the algorithm for solving initial value problems. Of course, we will develop this idea further to using Newton polynomials, okay, where we replace that function by Newton polynomial 
and develop a series of first order, second order, and third order methods in the next two lectures or so. And with that, we will wrap up this whole course. Okay. So we can stop there for now. If you have any questions, I'll answer that. Otherwise, we'll see on the quiz will be either Thursday or Tuesday. I'm not sure exactly when. Okay. Thank you.